it's pretty well part of the fabric of, of English culture, really, because it not only is it a play, um, several films, um, uh, an opera, there's uh, levels of music, etc. So I only found out the other day that the wedding march is from um, this in my stream. So you live and learn. So it is really um, a, a, a sort of a cornerstone of, of what we class as being English popular culture, and uh, culture with a small other capital C. Um, it's a play which I... Sorry, I'll... Deep in the heart. Okay, go on. And... I never, I never sort of get tired of, of going through it. So, if you can just bear with me, I'm going to go through the first couple of scenes. So, on your very first page, You've got a little diagram I'm going to come back to. I'm going to start with that one scene one. I'm going to read it. So if you read it with me, um, you'll get the drift of the first scene. I'm going to look at the scene pretty well to get us rolling with the whole play. Because Shakespeare produces plays which are very complex, densely complex. You don't have to take them complexly because they work at all sorts of levels. But there's no doubt at all that there's a heck of a lot inside this play. And I'm hoping to give you a, 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 the flavour of that by tackling the first bit quite sort of closely, as it used to be called, closely. Okay? At his palace, Theseus, the Duke of Athens, and although it's a Duke, it's like a king, we're talking about a place where Greece was a group of city states. It wasn't a country as we would think of it now. Uh, that wasn't me, that was the machine. Uh, it was a group of states. And what this means is Shakespeare can use that and can play with it in a particular way. It's not a country like we know with set laws. The laws existed only inside the city. Because that's the only place they could be policed. Outside of the city, there wasn't any particular law. Unless you went to another city, and then you came under their sort of heading and their sort of law. Which means that you've created little islands of culture or civilization in a country which was quite lawless um, and quite dangerous in terms of animals and brigands and things like that. So Theseus was the Duke of Athens, and Hippolyta, his fiancée, discussed their wedding. Now, one of the things which comes across from Shakespeare's analysis of this play is what he's doing, he's pinching pieces from all over. A lot of the play has been stolen from Chaucer and from Greek mythology and from Ovid's Metamorphosis, a Latin translation of a great deal of the myths. This might go against the grain for so many people to think that Shakespeare pinched anything, but I can prove it. <laughs> and not only, that, not only does he do that, but he actually plays with it. He knows that his audience knows he's pinching it, and he uses little bits that they will be familiar with. The lovely thing about this particular play, I mean Shakespeare in general, but particularly in this play, is you've got this wonderful double presentation. Shakespeare, I'm going to argue, is talking about sex, or he's talking about love and fertility which we would translate nowadays as sex. He's talking about the life force in a particular zone. He's talking about couples. There are four couples in the play who are all having struggles with their relationships. That's what the play is about. Like all folk tales, all fairy tales, he's giving us a story four times over. This is how one couple do it, this is how another couple do it, this is how another couple do it, this is how another couple do it. So he's giving us a hierarchy of couples having problems and sorting themselves out. Now, in doing that, he very cleverly goes right back to ancient Greece. He's writing at the time, the Reformation and the very strict Catholic Protestant problems in uh, late 15th century, sorry, the 1500s, early 1600s. This play was probably written about 1590. And at that time, to say the wrong thing about religion meant that they gave you a very serious operation where they took the top part right off completely. There was no messing about. 
The censorship rules were extremely strong, extremely powerful censorship rules. And what he does to get past all this Christian, if you like, dogma about sexuality, about fertility, about paganism, is he goes right back to classical Greece. All of the nobility, everybody in the top echelons of his theatre goers would have been trained in Latin and Greek. To study the classics meant that they weren't pre-Christian. The stories he's, he's pinching from are pre-Christian, pre-Christ. Which meant that most of the nobles would have understood them, they would have studied them in their grammar schools and in their public schools and in their universities. And it was a way of bypassing the problems of speaking to people about situations that they knew in everyday life, but which they couldn't speak of openly because of the censorship that the church imposed upon them. Not only does he do that, but he very sneakily talks about English folklore. He goes into the pagan part and brings in furries, who are very distinctly the furries of the Forest of Arden from where he was as a boy. These are Peas Blossom and Cobweb. These are not classical gods, but these are common everyday sprites. And he puts Robin Goodfellow in there, or Puck, who is very definitely a local sprite. We've got one in the machine, I think. Yeah. <laughs> In doing that, he's speaking also to the common people, to the country people, to the farmers and the peasants that are coming to the place as well. One of the things that's worth noting about the globe is, if you ever get a chance to go to see the globe in London, it's fascinating to look at it because it's an it's a incredibly well-designed machine for watching plays. You can get about a thousand people in the globe and you can each one of those people is no more than about 50 foot from the stage. So you're very close up to the actors. You're involved in the play directly. And the plays would have been done uh, every day. So we know that most of the plays would have been seen by something like about a tenth of the population of London. If it was successful, and most of his plays were, he was seeing, a thousand people were seeing his play a day. He was getting through most of the population of London. It's not very so most of the did a good percentage of the, of the uh, population of London. So he's a very influential character, far more influential than sort of a TV program today, because everybody would have been speaking about and talking about the play that was on in London, um, in the globe. So in that sense, it's a very effective way of getting through to a large number of people. The globe itself is tiered. The people at the top paid threepence, in the middle they paid twopence, and on the floor where they stood, they only paid a penny. So it was literally structured socially as well. The nobility would go, the merchant classes would go, and the peasants would go. His plays had to fight for an audience because going on around them, they were selling chestnuts, there's supposed to have been prostitutes, beer would have been sold in spirits, and there would have been all sorts of performers and charlatans working the crowd at the same time as the play was on. So it was rather more like a marketplace, perhaps, than the theatre. It was put on mostly in daylight. They hadn't got round to lanterns and uh, limelight or anything like that. They were coming in, you know, hundreds of years later. But the plays were, so the plays were done in, in the winter, they had been done in the afternoon, in the uh, summer, they had been done in the early evening. Now into this, you've got this, this character who's bringing a lot of people forward. Um, he's presenting plays which have got to interest people, so they've got to be about the things that touch them deeply. They're going to spend money and come and see them. And he does this in very clever, very subtle ways. He does this with the classical myth, which is there for the nobility. And he does it with the pagan stories, the furry stories, which are also woven into the, into the whole fabric. And he's doing this to speak about something which he thinks is very important, which is the way that men and women relate to each other. And beyond that, what it is inside of us that promotes this, this need for relationship. 